Hello, good evening, everyone. Thanks for signing up the class and showing up on time today. Uh, would you like to turn your camera on? Let's get started. Can you all hear me? Great, thanks. Uh, your, your first name is just Anne. Anne? Okay, cool. Yes, yes. Hey, great to see you guys. Uh, so, Adi, uh, so, get, uh, how to pronounce your first name? Sorry. Uh, it's just Sid, but I, I that's my dad's computer. So, okay, okay, it's just uh, say uh, it's Sid, S I D, S A D. Okay, Sid. Okay, uh, Angela, uh, I think we have a few more here. Uh, I said, I see, got, got you, thank you. I see, Claire, I got you, no problem. Uh, let me see. So Richard, Belinda, and, oh, we got two Angela. There's an, a second Angela, okay. Yeah, for the others, I would be really appreciate if you can turn the camera on because, you know, I want to make the class, you know, more interactive. Because you know we are a relative small class, around ten students, right? So, it uh, I want really want to see your face, especially you know your facial expression during the class, and then I will get a good sense about you know how you feel, whether you got a good understanding. Should I further explain a little bit more, or you know stuff like that, right? So I would be very appreciate if you could turn your camera on if there's and no technical issue, okay? Um, I'm going to leave for a minute since I need to go print the um, notes out. Oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah this is our I first time, right? That as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we are waiting for, you know, probably a few students joining and some students printing stuff, I want to just want to show you, you know, my fancy camera. <laughs> uh, let me see. Yeah, if you can see if I move around, it will follow me. It will keep, you know, tracking me. And we try to stand up slightly slowly. I hope it will now, you know, lose track of me. And I try to give a gesture. Hopefully it can recognize my whiteboard. Yeah, as you can see, right? Uh, I do have something on the whiteboard. I'm not sure whether you can see it clearly. Can you see it clearly? Yes. The content on the board? Not really, right? But I think it's mainly because of my mark. Now, let me see. How about this one? No problem, right? Okay, cool. I will mainly use my iPad, you know, uh, in addition to the Apple Pencil, but sometimes I think we, we can do something on the whiteboard. I think, you know, it's a different style, right? I, I kind of, as a traditional teacher, I like the traditional way, although I got used to, you know, the electronic devices. Okay, let me see. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, that's nice. good. Okay, great. Uh, and also, I have, yeah, I love organic can. You're right. <laughs> uh, I have it. Yeah, as you can see, you can see in my, my uh, working space, right? Now, say if I have a model, uh, this is a cyclohexane molecule. So I can show you the model. I think for some topics, we, I do want to show you the models for you to give a better sense. And I'm also preparing some materials for some you know, simple and safe demo, definitely not producing you know, any flame you know, or any uh, dangerous uh, flammable or you know, uh, corrosive stuff, but just some simple stuff. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I got this new, new stuff, cool thing. Uh, by the way, guys, I really want to check with each of you guys. I got, you know, Claire, you know, she is in the car. And how about Richard? And uh, let me see, Belinda and Beatrice. Uh, could you please turn your camera on? Uh, I, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, no problem. Oh, okay. I can't find my camera, so I might not be able to use it this class, if that's okay. Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Uh, can I, you, will you be able to get a camera later for our next time? 
yeah no i uh, i can do that okay cool thank you thank you i really appreciate because you know this is very you know important for the class but otherwise how about you just need to you know gather the recording and watch it and then that would be even better because you can you know choose what the pace you want right you can skip some contents you are more confident you can you know speed up you know let's say 1.5 times or even two times right okay I, I i totally got you guys but you know once again this is my expectation i hope you can understand and why i want to do this okay i appreciate yeah uh you can always ask for recordings no matter you attend the live session or you miss the live session due to any reason okay but that you need to send me email uh in advance and let me know and i will make sure i record the session okay uh, but if you know everyone attended probably i will not record the session okay great guys this, since this is our first time uh how about you know we spend a few minutes you know to introduce ourselves uh but since you know we have uh seven a student today so we can do the introduction of the students you know kind of you know uh group by group now say so we invite three students to introduce today and then we'll have another three you know for our next next class i also want to test myself whether i can you know, remember some key information of each of you guys. If there's too many at once, I probably will forget, okay? Uh, me, Dr. Chen, uh, I'm a high school teacher teaching a STEM-focused independent school in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, teaching all kinds of chemistry class, starting from honor scan, AP can, post-AP electives, organic chemistry, inorganic and analytical chemistry. So in addition, in addition to the teaching in my school, you know, I'm also a long time mentor and a volunteer for the Chemistry Olympia. Uh, let me share my screen with you guys. Uh, just list a few. So if you search USNCO in Google, the first link you got is the official website of the USNCO program, the US National Chemistry Olympia, right? Uh, uh, the first one I want to say is about the exam annotation project. Uh, so if you check the prepare for exams, you will see all of the test paper in the past, maybe 30 years or some, some of them are more than 30 years. So if the left one, the exam is the original test paper, the right link solutions is the annotations we you know, uh, have been worked on. So we published in you know, a lot of years of the annotation. So you know, those work had been published in the official website of ACS. I believe in the future, you guys will be beneficial from this program. Maybe it's a little bit too early for most of you guys at this moment. So make sure you check this website and the, the solutions. As you can see, we pretty much finished more than half of the local exam. And we are working on the other years. And most of them will be published, you know, I think by the end of this year, hopefully. And for national, as you can see, we also have, you know, a, about a little bit less than half of the years published. So this is the one, you know, uh, project I'm leading right now. Uh, we got about 40 volunteers from all of the world. Uh, most of them are high school, college students in the United States. Uh, another thing in the future, I believe you guys will be interested in joining the, the free uh, US Census supporting program. Let me see where is the supporting program about USNCO, acknowledgement, volunteer, how to participate, no rules. Uh, I think they reorganized the web page. So I kind of lose track of what is the link. Oh, I think it's here. Webinar and you know uh, other support. So the webinar, as you can see, I participated in which one? Yeah, I, I, you know, participate in this one, preparing for the US International Exam for Students as a panelist. I think this one is December 10th, 2021. It's last year. Uh, I think it's still very, you know, useful for students to watch, but maybe a little bit too early for you guys. Uh, yeah, USN coaching. I'm a leading coach in the US NCO supporting program. Uh, there are some materials, you know, attached here. Uh, if you click the organic one, you will see this one is actually made by made by me. Uh, yeah, several other stuff. So due to the limited time, I, uh, I cannot, you know, list all of the work, you know, I participated here. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, it's very, it's very, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to work with you guys, you know, for a, a whole season, which is made by 10 sessions, 10 live sessions. 
Uh, oh, regarding the time, I appreciate you guys, you know, uh, being on time today. But I do want to discuss you guys, you know, in the end of this session because I do got some uh, email uh, talking about, you know, uh, you know, the confusion. Uh, I apologize, you know, I, I messed it up. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Other than that, uh, I think we'll know each other more, you know, uh, as we uh, move forward. Okay. How about I invite Anne, Sid, and Angela, Angela Huang, to briefly introduce yourself today, since you know you guys turning your camera on. <laughs> yeah, just to briefly talk about you know what's your name, where you are from, which grade you are in, let's say uh, your background in chemistry or any other you know stuff you are doing, you like uh, anything you like. Okay, there's no limitation. Uh, who wants to go first? Sure, uh, you can go first, Anne. Hi, so my name is On. Um, I'm a senior at Tompkins High School in Houston, Texas. So this is my first and last year that I'm planning on competing in the chemistry Olympia. As um, prior, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I focused more towards biology. But obviously, as in some of your previous Zooms, you said that in the pre-med track, there's a lot of chemistry. So why not prepare now? Why not suffer a little bit now? Oh, oh, I so think you... I hope I hope to learn a lot under your guidance and definitely broaden my knowledge about chemistry much more outside the scope than perhaps the typical AP chemistry can do in school. I see, I see. Thanks for your trust first. And you know, you you are definitely a very unique student in, in my class, not just in this class, but also including all of students in the past, because Typically, I don't have any seniors in the in the class, but I do agree with you. You know, uh, the pre med you know pathway has a bunch of chemistry stuff, especially for organic and because organic chemistry is always you know one of the most challenging you know subject or topics for any you know students in the pre med direction, as you probably heard of, right? I think you already did a lot of homework about you know uh, how and you know you should further develop yourself. So I hope you know uh, you will get a good experience from this class. Hopefully, this class can be helpful for your future development. Okay, great. Uh, welcome, Anne. Uh, how about Eddie? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eddie. I live in New Jersey, although right now I'm in a hotel in California. But uh, I'm a sophomore. I'm going to be taking AP Chem this year. So I just thought it would be a good idea to take this course, maybe try some chemistry Olympiad. Uh, I also play chess competitively. Wow, wow. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe there's some correlation between a good chess player with a good you know, chemistry Olympiad you know, competitor. <laughs> but you know, taking AP CAN along with this class definitely is a good idea. But if you're not taking AP CAN this year, it's totally fine. But that means you might need to spend a little bit more time uh, because, you know, uh, the class is relatively fast paced. Uh, I believe it will be challenging to most of you guys. Uh, welcome, Adi. Thank you. Uh, Sid. Uh, hi. So my name is Sid. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Um, uh, I'm a rising sophomore and uh, I like to play tennis. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, um, Guys, you know, uh, we can have kind of three students to introduce for in the beginning of each class. So I will reserve in you know, the two Angela for our next time. Okay. Uh, so let's get started uh, about our class today. I believe you all got my email and you know got the invitation to the Google Classroom. I hope you are all in the Google Classroom. If you are not, please check your email and join the Google Classroom. The Google Classroom is a place for you to access all of the lecture notes, the problem sets, the homework, the answer key to the problem sets, any you know announcement, notification, everything. Okay. So. If there's anything very special, very important, I will follow up an email, but otherwise you should check everything from Google Classroom, okay? So, uh, is there anyone who didn't get the lecture notes? Let me know, okay? I can post it again in the, in the chat. Okay, it seems like everyone got it, very good. Uh, I strongly recommend you guys print it out and take notes during the class. And also I want to emphasize, please, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Feel free to stop me. 
I don't want to make the class, oh, only I'm talking and no one, everyone it seems like just listening. That is not the best way because sometimes you may feel, oh, my question may be too easy or too stupid or even actually it's not. When you ask questions, you can always give some good insight to the class, to the others, okay? Uh, sure, I will do that. Uh, give me a second, Angela. Yeah, guys, you know, feel free to just talk because I try to monitor the contents in the chat box, but sometimes I might miss it. So I don't want to, you know, uh, delay your questions. So please, you know, feel free to, oh, I don't know, due to some reasons, I cannot, you know, send. Uh... Okay, great, Angela. Great, you, you got it, right? Okay, guys, since this is our first class, we spend about 15 minutes to do some, you know, introduction about me, about some of you, about our class. So I plan to end this class at around 9.15, okay? I hope it works for you guys. And we'll take a five minutes break during the, the, the middle, okay? Let's get started. Um, so we have 10 lecture notes in the season. Uh, we'll start from stoichiometry. As you may know, this name is pretty, looks pretty fancy, but the general idea is the calculation related to the chemical equation. So basically we have a balanced equation. We want to figure out, you know, some unknown parameters based on some known parameters, okay? Uh, I'm assuming you guys already did some homework. That means you went over my lecture notes and went over some of the questions and you probably still have some you cannot, you know, answer or you do not have a great understanding, okay? So let's directly go to this question. If the Afghanistan constant is, 3.01 rather than 6.02. Actually, it's supposed to be 6.02, right? And how does the molar mass and the relative atomic mass of carbon change respectively? Guys, let's focus on the molar mass first. So I will, you know, give you a poll. Now say A is no change. Listen carefully, okay? B is halved. C is double. D is, I'm not sure, okay? So I want to get your understanding. Oh, it seems like I have a not sure here. So it's fine. You can choose D or choose just not sure. This is anonymous based. So feel free to, you know, share your, your thoughts. You got my question, right? The off gathered constant, the new one is not 6.02, is 3.01. How about the molar mass? A molar mass is the mass of one mole of substance. Guess this is a pretty conceptual question. Okay, great. Thanks for your prompt response. Let me show the results. It seems like the majority of you guys chose B. Actually, B is the correct answer. And let me briefly explain that. So molar mass is the mass of one mole of substance. But now your definition of one mole is halved, right? So obviously the mass is also halved. Does this make sense to you? Especially for students who chose A, C, and D? If not, please ask, okay? I, I can further explain. So my second question is, how does the relative atomic mass change? What is the definition of the relative atomic mass? It's about, we use the mass of an atom to compare with one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12. Guys, can you help me you know, recall what is the meaning of carbon 12? What does that mean exactly? Eddie, what do you think? Carbon 12? It's like the most standard isotope of carbon with uh, six protons and six neutrons. Wow, wow, very accurate. I think it includes all of the information about the carbon 12, most common isotope of carbon, six protons, six neutrons. So the 12 here actually is called the mass number, right, the mass number. So we use one 12th of the mass of this special, you know, atom as a standard. And then we compare the mass of the other atoms with this, you know, standard. We got, you know, a number that's called the relative atomic mass. This is the meaning of relative. Okay, so now my question is, how does this change if the Afghanistan constant is different? Okay, so I will ask the question again. Uh, 
Okay, uh, you guys are pretty fast, actually. Thanks. Uh, we are. We we need to have one more submission, and then we can, you know, share the results and briefly talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Still, majority of students showed A. A is the correct answer. Is there's no change. Why no change? Remember, relative atomic mass is defined to compare with one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12, which is not related to the definition of one mole at all, right? We don't care about how many particles is in one mole because they are not really related, right? So many of you, three of you chose B, one half, that is for molar mass and not for the relative atomic mass, okay? Let me know if you, you need me to further explain, okay, guys? I want to, I want to have everyone to get a good experience from this class. So I need you, your cooperation and your feedback, okay? Thank you. Uh, I will close it. Um, so I think, how does the mode define? Uh, we can easily answer this question. So it's just, you know, a 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23rd particles is defined a one mode one more right that's our definition and this is a constant called f gatherers constant this is an italian guy and you know we celebrate the mo day have you heard about the mo day like the pi day the e day the i day for mass the mo day is for chemistry so we celebrate the mo day in october 23rd that makes sense right that's 10 to the power of, you know 23rd uh, so, you know, in my school, we, 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 we typically, we do some activities. Uh, how to interpret counting by weighing? Uh, I think I can use an example to show you. Now say you got several thousand pennies, right? And you need to count it. So you definitely can do count it one by one. Right? It will take, you know, maybe 30 minutes or even longer. But if you got 10,000 or even more, you know, counting one by one, one, by one is not a good idea. This is exactly when you need to count the atoms because there's so many atoms and they are way too tiny, right? So how should we, you know, use a different way to count the pennies? So I will measure the mass of each of them. And then we'll measure the total mass. And then I'll use the total mass divided by the mass of each of them. And I got a number, right? This is called counting by weight. But, you know, for atoms, you know, measure the mass of each atom is also not practical, right? Because it's just too light. So I will get a group, a set of atoms, and then measure their mass. And then I use a similar strategy, right? I got the total mass. I use that mass divided by that group mass and then times the number of atoms in that group, in that set. Does this make sense to you guys? Great, thank you. So what is our set? Our set is one more. It's 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. That is our set. So why we use this very special number is not an integer 6.02, right? The benefit is the molar mass, the mass of one mole of substance or atom equals to the relative atomic mass exactly. So this is the benefit. So we can briefly explain this later, not today, but probably next class. Why, you know, when we set up this number, they will be exactly the same. So the, what is the benefit? Let me you know, introduce again. So if you want to know the mass of one mole of hydrogen, the only thing you need to do is to read the atomic mass of hydrogen from the periodic table, right? Ah, uh -huh, Sid, I got a message. <laughs> July 2nd, oh, you mean June 2nd, right? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, the official, there is a kind of official website for the Mo Day celebration. If you check it, they said we should celebrate the Mo Day starting from 6.2 a.m. until 6.2 p.m. <laughs> so it's a little bit weird, right? So you can celebrate for the whole day, but you know, just something funny, interesting. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. So for example, if I want to know what is the molar mass of water. 
That means for one mole of water molecules, what is the mass? I will check the periodic table. I will check the atomic mass of hydrogen, which is 1.008. Uh, I have many significant figures. I will explain this later, okay? And I have 16.00, or probably if you check it, it will be 15.999. I don't know how many nines it shows, but it depends on which kind of your table you refer to. And then I will use this times two plus this. I will get a number around 18, right? So that means for one mole of water molecules, it's supposed to be 18 grams. Does this make sense to you guys? This is the benefit for us to set up a very special constant because only by using this constant we can give an equal sign between the molar mass with the relative atomic mass uh, but if it's a molecule you need to count you know the number of the atoms okay uh, I, I want to add one more thing about relative atomic mass actually the full name should be weight average But typically we don't say this. What does this mean? Because you know, each atom actually is made by several isotopes, right? So that means the atomic mass on the periodic table already consider or count the contribution of each isotope. So this is one of the reasons why for oxygen, the atomic mass is not exactly 16. For carbon, it's not exactly 12. It's typically 12.01. Why? because there is carbon 13, there is carbon 14 with a relative you know, small abundance, but they will also contribute right, with a very minor contribution. So what is the meaning of weight? So basically we need to use the atomic mass of each to times the abundance. Yes, exactly. Yeah, thanks, Sid. So we need to times the abundance percent or the abundance. Let's take carbon 12, for example. So I should use 12 times, let's say 99 point something. I didn't check the abundance, guys, but it should be more than 99%. And plus 13 times, let's say 0 point something percent, right? And plus 14 times another 0 point some percent. But I need to check the data, but this is called weight average. Guys, please stop me if you, you know, are not, you know, fully, you know, getting this, okay? because the class is relatively fast paced. I'm assuming you guys already did some homework, but if you didn't, or if you missed this part, just let me know, I can fully explain. Okay, great, let's move forward. The second part is called Mo is the central concept. As you can see, I put the Mo in the central circle, but I have several circles surrounding it, right? What I want to say is this N typically representing the number of moles or it is called the amount of substance. But you know, this name actually is less commonly used. We typically we just say the mole number or how many moles, but you understand the official name of this parameter is called the amount of substances expressed in how many moles. And the N is called the number of particles. The number of particles can be the number of atoms, the number of molecules, the number of ions, or you know, the number of anything, let's say, one more of iPhone, right? Although we know not all of the iPhones are exactly the same. So actually one more of iPhone is not really a very valid, you know, uh, statement. So how can we do this conversion? If we already know how many moles, how can we get a number of the particles? What do you think, Sid? Uh, Any so idea? Yeah, mole times uh, the number of uh, uh, atoms there are, so like 6.022. Very good. That basically means we use the mole number multiplied by the F gathers constant, which equals to 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. Guys, uh, if you, you know, read the textbook, you will see it to use N, A, N, and A are both uppercased but the A is a, uh, this is called subscript, right? 
But you know, you don't have to remember this. But I typically will use this kind of you know ladder to represent you know the the physical parameter. So I hope you can get get used to it. But you don't have to remember it. Okay. So you just need to multiply by the Avogadro's constant. Makes sense to you guys, right? Because this is a number of particles in one mole, and now we know how many moles, right? This is kind of, you know, you eat three apples a day, you know, how many apples you eat for a month, right? It's just simple at, at that. But if you, this is the first time for you to uh, study stuff like this, it may take a while for you to get used to and, you know, quickly think about the connection and the equations and how to do the conversion, okay? Um, the next one is mass. How can we convert the moles into the mass? Yeah, go ahead, Anne. So you have the number of moles, so you just do unit conversion. So you multiply by one mole of whatever substance it is, and you have the molar mass on top. This will give you Got the it. number of grams in your substance. Yeah, so we multiply by the molar mass. That is the mass of one mole of stuff. So basically the mass of one mole stuff times how many mole? and I got the, the mass, right? Very good. So I will quickly move forward to the volume. The volume is for gas only, guys. We are talking about gas only. So that means if we want to know the volume of a certain mole of gas, what I need to have is the molar volume. If I know what is the molar volume of the gas, I should get the, the volume of several moles of the gas, right? The good news is for all of the gas, if we assume they are ideal gas, all of them, no matter what is the gas, regardless the identity of the gas, the molar volume is, a, is the same. So now say one mole helium has the same volume with one mole of oxygen. That is something we'll, we will discuss you know, by the end of this season, ideal gas law. But this is a conclusion. You probably can think about why, because the size of the particles compared to the distance between the gas molecules is negligible. So this is why different gas molecules have the same volume because the space, the volume is mainly taken by the space between them. And the space is controlled by the pressure and the temperature, right? So under the same condition, that means the same pressure and temperature, no matter what is the gas, they have the same molar volume. Yes, Sid, thank you. I think, you know, next time you definitely can share, you know, the message with everyone. I think everyone can see that. So Sid, give me a very important number. This is called the molar volume, 22.4 liter per mole. That means for one mole of gas, no matter what is the gas, they always have 22.4 liter. You probably would say, wait, is this always true? No. Think about if I heat the, the gas, the volume definitely will expand, right? So what are we talking about if we say 22.4? What kind of condition? Go ahead, Anne. Uh, it has to be an STP. Very good. So what is STP exactly? If I remember correctly, the abbreviation is standard temperature pressure. Yeah, so we have two parts. One is called standard temperature. Another part is called standard pressure. So what is the standard temperature and the pressure respectively? Uh, it's 25 degrees Celsius and uh, one atmospheric pressure. I agree with your one ATM. How about the standard temperature? Is it 25 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Celsius? Which one do you think is the more standard? Although it's just a definition, right? We don't have good reasoning for this. I would say 25 is more like a room temperature, right? This is how we control our air conditioner in the house. We like around 24, 26, but different people may have different comf comfortable temperature, right? But for me, you know, if it's too, too, too low, I feel too cold. So it's zero degree Celsius, right? It's zero degree Celsius. That means it is 273 Kelvin. So this is the standard temperature. Only when it's STP, we can use this special constant molar volume, okay? Otherwise we cannot use it. 
Okay, great guys. Uh, let's try this, you know, very simple practice problem. Let me see how many of you got checked, guys. Please always access to a periodic table. If you have a large periodic table hand on the wall in front of you, that would be the best. If you cannot get that, feel free to, you know, just use ptable.com. So you search p table and you go to p table.com you can access you know there are so many different versions of periodic table but this one you know easy to remember you can always access okay so check the model mass if you need okay so the question i will not going to read it but i will give you the options so now say a is 3.01 times this 23 b is 6.02 the others are the same c is now say 12.04 times this much, and D is, I'm not sure, okay? Yeah, think about, uh, well, oh, sorry, guys, do, 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 do. relaunch. Think about for 30 seconds before you submit, okay? <laughs> Basically, we're asking how many moles of atoms are there, right? Because one mole is 6.02, two mole is 12.04. If 0 0.5 mole is 3.01, right? Okay, it seems like it's a bit confusing because I saw several students got a little bit you know, hesitated, right? Not responding in the first you know, minute. Okay, guys, I think we can briefly talk about, you know, the tricky points. The first one, the molecule is O2. So there are two oxygen atoms, right? So if you check the periodic table, I believe the molar mass or the atomic mass of each oxygen, or well, one oxygen is, a, uh, this is like a 10. I should say one oxygen is around 16, right? It's around 16. That means for each mole of oxygen atom is 16 gram, no problem, right? But now what I got is a O2 molecule. So that means it is actually 32 gram per mole of O2. Do you guys agree with me? Because there are two atoms in one molecule. So I want to show my forework, how can I figure it out? So I got 16 grams of the molecule I should use this way, right? Because I can cancel the gram and get how many moles of O2. But the question actually is asking how many oxygen atoms. So I need to figure out for each mole of O2, I got two mole of oxygen atom, right? Atoms. Do you guys agree with me? So it's a, a bit confusing. We're kind of, you know, times two divided by two again and again. And finally, I know in one mole of oxygen atom, there are 6.02 times 10 to the power 23rd atom. So now something magic you can see. I use grand grand cancel, one mole, one mole cancel, mole and mole cancel. So I got a number. So you will see. This is one half and then times two. So the first part will just give you one mole oxygen atom. Let me emphasize is oxygen atom. So the correct answer is actually B, is actually B. So as you can see, it's not a hard question, but I will say two thirds of you got confused, right? Or got, you know, tricked by the question. Uh, so this is a kind of a question from the USNCO, right? Uh, so it's not hard, but you may need to be very careful. Sometimes if you're too fast, you will make mistakes. Okay. Uh, did I make it clear, guys? Thank you. Uh, I will temporarily skip this question and morality. I want to hold it for our next class. I don't want to give you too much you know, new stuff. 
but we can briefly talk about this one, which is called the molarity. The molarity is one way to express the concentration, basically how much solute is dissolved in a solution. So how we define the molarity, it defined as the most of the solute divided by the volume of the solution. So this is why it has a unit of typically mole per liter. But this liter is one liter of solution. This mole is one mole of solute, okay? Keep this in mind, guys. This is a very common used term. So that means you have to memorize it. But actually, actually after you, you know, do some practice, this will be pretty natural, like one plus one equals to two, right? You don't need to remember one plus one equals to two because you know you always know it. Guys, pay attention to the different units here and here. The molar volume is a liter per mole, but this liter is for gas, is the volume of the gas. And the mole per liter, which is the molarity. So this liter is the volume of the solution. Lead, the volume of the solution. Make sense, guys? Okay, great. So uh, we'll quickly see an example how to calculate molarity in the on the next page. So I will temporarily skip this one, okay, guys? We'll you know, go back to this question next time to talk about what is molality, how different it is compared to molarity, and why we want to have this concept. Okay, guys, there's a slightly complicated question. Concentrated sulfuric acid, which is 98%, what does this mean? That means you have 98 gram of pure sulfuric acid out of 100 gram of solution. So this is how we define the mass percent is the mass of the pure solute divided by the mass of the solution. Okay. So if we want to convert this mass percent into molarity, let me write it down again. Molarity equals to the moles of the solute divided by the volume of the solution. Okay. So how can we, you know, make this conversion? What kind of, you know, parameter we need? This is a little bit you know, challenging. So next thing, uh, go ahead, Anne. You said that we need to have the mole of the solutes. We need information regarding the, well, obviously you're not gonna give it us the number of moles straight away. So I assume you would need something regarding the mass. Something that has to do with the mass of the solute. And you have to do some calculations to get your number of moles. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to convert the mass of the solute into the mass of, sorry, into the moles of the solute, right? I think this is relatively straightforward. We definitely need to use the molar mass. If I know the mass of one mole, and then I can use the mass, the total mass divided by the mass of the one mole, and then I got how many moles, right? So this is a kind of mathematical way but when you show the work, you probably were doing this way, guys. Let me write it down. I want to convert this 98 gram into how many moles? How should I do that? I will say 98 gram times one mole of pure sulfuric acid. What is the mass, right? How can we find this, guys? Give me one keyword. How do we know the molar mass of sulfuric acid? You check from the periodic table, you get the atomic mass of each element, right? And you add them together, right? Hydrogen is one, you got two hydrogens. Sulfur is 32, you got one. Oxygen is 16, you got four. And then you add them together and then you will see is exactly 98 gram 
for each mole of sulfuric acid. You don't need to remember this, okay? Guys, when you are working on practice, you can definitely directly search in Google molar mass of H2SO4. This is a lazy way it can give you the answer quickly, right? But when you are taking the test, you cannot search in Google, right? So you do need to know how to get this number by just using the periodic table, okay? Okay, so now we got the moles, right? And next, we also need to convert the mass of the solution into the volume of the solution. Guys, how can we do this? How can we convert the mass into the volume? Go ahead, Eddie. We need to know the density of the compound. And yeah, we need to know the density of the solution, right? Okay, guys, I already gave you the density. If the density is 1.84 gram per milliliter, so I will write down this way, is 1.84 gram per one milliliter. So you can see how I cancel the unit and now the denominator is just the most and the denominator is the milliliter, right? So you can solve the problem. Uh, let me use my phone uh, with my phone to quickly get the answer. The denominator is just one. The denominator right now is, okay. I got one over 54, and then the unit I got is mole per milliliter, right? Guys, pay attention to the unit. But typically we want to express the molarity into mole per liter rather than mole per milliliter, okay? So guys, we need to further convert. So you can use different ways. You can show your full work again, but typically I'm a little bit lazy because I know in one milliliter, the mole number is definitely smaller. In one liter, it will be larger. So I will directly times 1,000. to get into the mole per liter. But you definitely can use any way you like, but don't make a mistake. If you need to times 1,000, don't divide it by 1,000, okay? So we got the answer. I believe this is about 18.4 mole per liter. So that is our final answer. So we got the molarity of the concentrated sulfuric acid with a mass percent of 98%, okay? So basically we finished this question, right? We finished this question. Guys, uh, is this pace okay for you guys? Especially for those, you know, who has difficulty in turning your camera on, I do need to get some response from you guys, you know, send me something, okay? If you feel good, if you feel bad, you definitely should send me something, okay? Great, thanks. Okay, the next is a very important experiment. Uh, you know, I'm assuming most of you guys didn't get a chance to really work in the lab. Maybe some of you did, like Anne, like, you know, uh, Addy, right? Who probably already took on a scan or even AP can, right? So this is a very typical experiment, preparation of a standard solution. What does this mean? Standard means a solution with a known molarity or known concentration. Is a solution with a known molarity. So that means we need to, you know, figure out a certain way to get the solution with a known molarity. So first let's have a look how we do this experiment. First, will measure a certain mass of the sample. Now say the sample here is cobalt chloride dihydrate. Dihydrate means there are two water molecules binded in the compound, okay? This is called hydrated crystals. A lot of crystals are hydrated. There are some water molecules inside, but it's not a mixture. It is a pure substance, okay? We measure 10.0 gram by using a top loading balance. 
guys, we, we don't do the experiment. We cannot do it, but I want to introduce you the instrument, the principle, the details of the operation of you know, some important experiment in our class. And then I have a 500 milliliter volume metric flask. Guys, this one is called volume metric flask. You understand what does a flask look like, right? But volumetric, the meaning means the volume is fixed. It has a certain volume, but there's only one mark. You see the mark here, right? So that means if you add a solution of water into the flask, when the water reaches to that mark, the solution inside is exactly 500 milliliter, okay? So that means you cannot use this flask to measure any other volume because there's no other marks available. There's only one mark. So it's a fixed number, it's only for 500 milliliter, okay? And then we dissolve our sample, the cobalt chloride dihydrate into the flask. Oh, interesting, use arsenal, okay? NASA is arsenal, okay? I don't know why they need to use arsenal. I think we should use water. So anyway, it doesn't matter. And then, we swore the flask to help dissolve the solid and we got a solution. This is a blue solution, it's beautiful. And then we add, I believe we should add water, but you know, since this is an arsenal solution, we'll keep adding arsenal and then to this mark and then we stop. So now how can we you know, calculate the molarity? Hey, Aaron, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll be able uh, sorry, to I'm, on. Oh, sorry, I'm kind of late. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, I have recorded the session. I will send you the first, let's say, about one hour. We, we spend about, you know, um, 15 minutes for introduction of me and others and some fundamental information of this class. So actually, we kind of, you know, spend one hour in the discussion for the lecture notes. Uh, can you turn your right, camera on? Good. Yeah. Okay, it seems like uh, uh, I'm riding in the car. I see. Okay, okay, okay. I appreciate you guys. You know, try your best to access. You know the the the. the the class with me so feel free to turn it off if you you know if there's any issue okay great guys how can we i already got the answer here how can we you know gather results uh, i don't know how many of you already tried this so i will show my work but at the meantime you should be working on your own work okay and then i will briefly explain my work if you all feel good we can you know speed up a little bit
Okay, uh, I'm done. Uh, I hope you guys are almost here. So I made a mistake, you know, for my first trial, uh, I got the molar mass of calcium chloride by dihydrate di with not the cobalt chloride, right? One is Ca, another one is Co, right? Uh, so this is actually a good reminder because in the test, you don't have the answer, right? So if you made a mistake, you probably just made the mistake. There's no way you can figure it out, right? So, you know, be careful for the first time. Uh, we use the molar mass of the substance here, and then we got the moles, and then we divide it by the volume of the solution, which is the volume of the volumetrical flask, and then you got the answer. Does this make sense to all of you guys? Okay, great. So I think now you probably can summarize how to prepare a solution with a certain molarity by yourself, right? Now say, if I told you, I want to prepare a solution is 1.00 molar of cobalt by using the same solid, the same volumetric flask. What is my first step? My first step is to do some calculation, right? I want to figure out how many grams of the sample I need to measure, right? Because obviously this molarity is different from this one, right? So I cannot use 10 grams anymore. I should use more because this is more concentrated, right? But how many more? You need to do the calculation. So think about how to do that. And then after I got the mass, okay, I will do the mass measurement by using the balance. And then I will transfer the sample, the solid, into the volumetric flask. And then I will add some solvent to dissolve it, swirl it, make sure all of the solid is gone. And then I will further add the solvent to the mark. And then finally, I will cap my flask, right? And label the solution, right? What is the solution? Cobalt chloride. What is the molarity? 1.00 molar. Who made it? Dr. Chen. What is the date, right? Well, sometimes, you know, some solutions has a limited shelf life or shelf time. So we do want to see when this solution was made. If it's too long, I may need to concern, okay, this solution probably has some issue with the molarity because, you know, it's changing, right? Okay, any question for me, guys, regarding this experiment? Cool. So uh, let's finish uh, this part and then we'll take a short break, okay? So if the dissolution process has obvious heat released or absorbed, we need to slightly revise our process. Did you see the difference? What is the change actually compared to the previous you know, procedures? Angela, what do you think? Angela Huang? Um, is it like, yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can, you know, check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Number one is measure the mass. Number two is dissolve the solid. Number three is transfer the solution to the flask. Number four is adding some solvent. Number five is adding solvent to the mark. Number six, you know, is put the cap on. Number seven is swirl it completely, make sure the solution is homogeneous. Which step is different? Um. Seven or like six or seven? Did you see previously we directly dissolve our sample in the flask, but this time we dissolve it in the beaker. Why should we do this? Think about this, right? Because the flask actually is a very precise volumetric glassware, which is sensitive to temperature. That means the volume is 500 is 500.00, but only under a certain temperature. You know the glass will expand if the temperature is getting higher, right? Which will affect the volume. So this is why instead of dissolving the solid in the flask directly, we chose to dissolve in the beaker first, 
and then cool the solution down to room temperature and then do the transfer. Does this make sense, guys? So you need to be a little bit flexible. You may need to do some homework or research to see, oh, whether this dissolution process is exothermic or not. If it's releasing a lot of heat, you might need to dissolve in a beaker and then transfer the solution to the flask. Oh, by the way, guys, what is the purpose of this step? Number four. It seems like we are washing the, the beaker, right? Why do we need to wash in the beaker? Actually, we need to do it two to three times. It's not called washing, it's called rinsing. What difference between rinsing and washing? Washing is you just put a lot of amount of water, right? Typically, when you, you know, wash the bowl in the kitchen, you probably will you know, run the, the water all the time, right? Although it's not a good idea, right? But typically, we will do it that way. But rinsing is use a small amount of water or solvent to you know, really clean all of the places, make sure all of the solution is transferred to the flask. Now, say if we don't do the rinsing process, now say if we skip number four, we directly dump all the solution into the flask, and then we continue. How does this operation affect our final molarity? Is the final molarity higher or lower than your expectation, or is supposed to be? Go ahead, Anne. I'm not hundred percent sure, but um, I would assume that the rinsing process is a more precise way. Like, it's like when you pour water, if you're trying to pour it to a precise, you don't just dump it as you say because that's too fast for you to control. But under, if you put small, 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 then it's ah. it rises a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and when you want to stop, you can stop it exactly where you want. So okay. to answer your question, if you just dump it all in. Well, we don't know how the molarity is because we may not know how much is in that beaker at that given but moment. So it, it will be higher or lower, basically. Your final mm -hmm. molarity will be lower or higher compared to if we do number four, we don't skip anything. I will say lower, perhaps. Okay, okay, good guess. Eddie, what do you think? I think if you don't rinse, then there is going to be some stuff left in the beaker when if you just like try to dump everything in because like sometimes it's sticky or something. So I think the final molarity will be lower because like you put less solute in. Does this make sense to you guys? I'm not sure whether you try to, you know, not say dump some porridge to another container. You cannot dump all of them, right? There's always some residue left in the internal wall of the container, right? So this is why we need to rinse it because we rinse it two to three times and every time we dilute, we kind of gather, you know, as much as we can to, into the flask, right? But still, there might be a tiny bit left, but that is in the tolerance of, you know, our, um, what that call, Mm, it's called, you know, we do have some arrow, but we accept, you know, any experiment should have some arrow, but if the arrow is not too big, we are okay with that. That is something related to significant figures. We will discuss this later, okay? So the rinsing process is to make sure we transfer all of the sample into the flask. Otherwise, the molarity will be lower because some solid, Actually, it dissolved in the residue of the beaker, which is not completely transferred to the flask. Okay, guys, uh, let's take a five minutes break. I will restart at 8.40 Eastern time. Okay, see you guys in a few minutes.
Okay, guys, let's get started. Uh, it seems like my camera is not in the right way. Can okay, now it's good. Okay, uh, 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 I don't want to have this. Okay, cool. Welcome back, guys. Uh, let's continue. I hope you you know took a break and you relax a little bit. Yeah, I uh, will also temporarily skip this question about morality. Uh, but you know, I saw some of you send me message. It seems like you already got a good understanding about morality, right? So feel free to finish this question. Uh, the next experiment here is how to dilute a solution. Basically, we already got a solution with a certain molarity. So how can we dilute the solution to get a, a you know, less concentrated one, okay? Uh, I want to show you a video because there is a, you know, relatively new, you know, equipment or a glassware, stuff like this. This is called the volumetric pipette. So based on the name, guys, can you think about how many marks that this thing has? It's called a volumetric pipette. Just one, right? Thank you, Anne. As you can see from here, that means if you got a solution up to that mark, the volume of solution inside is a fixed number. Now say this is a 20 milliliter volumetric pipette. That means it is 20, right? Okay. So how to operate this glassware? Let me find a short video. It's called volume. Can I search something? Uh, okay, while you match the pipettes, okay, it seems like my English is not very good. Let me try it again. <laughs> uh, while you match the pipette, ah, okay, okay, um. I think we can use this one to have a quick look. Give me a second. Let me turn the sound off. Volumetric pipettes are glass or plastic tubes, usually between 1 and 100 milliliters. Used for accurate measurements, volumetric pipettes are calibrated to deliver only one specific volume. The specifications of a volumetric pipette are usually imprinted on the pipette itself. The specifications indicate how much liquid will be transferred if the liquid is drawn up to the calibration line on the neck, the temperature at which the calibration was made, and whether it is a TD or a TC pipette. TD means that the pipette is calibrated to accurately deliver the specified volume of liquid. TC means that the pipette is calibrated to contain the specified volume of liquid with no remainders. To begin, the pipette should be inspected for cleanliness. If water beads up or collects on the inner surface, the pipette is not clean. Follow a cleaning procedure or obtain a clean pipette. Pour the liquid to be pipetted into a beaker. Make sure there is sufficient liquid to fill the pipette and to rinse three times. Using a pipette bulb, draw up a small quantity of the liquid to be pipetted and thoroughly rinse the entire interior surface by rolling the pipette horizontally with a slight rocking motion. Drain the rinse liquid into a waste beaker. Repeat the rinsing procedure at least two more times. Using the pipette bulb, Drop the solution into the pipette until it is filled to about 2 to 3 centimeters above the graduation mark. Remove the bulb and quickly place your forefinger over the top of the pipette stem. Make certain that there are no air bubbles in the bulk of the liquid or foam at the surface. Tilt the pipette slightly from the vertical position and wipe the outside of the lower stem with lint-free tissue to remove any adhering liquid. Hold the pipette vertically with the tip touching the inner wall of a waste vessel and slowly allow the liquid level to drop by slightly decreasing the finger pressure. 
halting further flow when the bottom of the meniscus coincides exactly with the top of the graduation mark. The pipette must be held vertically with the mark at eye level. Move the pipette to the receiving vessel with the pipette held vertically and the pipette tip touching the wall. Allow the sample to drain freely. Once the liquid appears to be completely drained, leave the pipette for an additional five seconds by counting to 10. Do not blow or shake out the small amount remaining in the tip, as the pipette is calibrated to deliver a specified volume with a small amount remaining. To review, the steps are, first, inspect the pipette for cleanliness, and rinse the pipette with the liquid to be pipetted. Use a pipette bulb to fill the pipette above the graduation mark. Wipe the outside of the pipette using a lint-free tissue to avoid contamination. Drain the liquid until the bottom of the meniscus sits on the graduation mark. And lastly, drain the sample into a receiving vessel, retaining the tip of the pipette on the wall of the receiving vessel for five seconds. I think this is a nice and short video. Uh, I don't know how many of you used the, the volumetric pipette before. So we need to, you know, use the, the, the ball, right? The pipette ball to help you producing a pressure difference. So basically, if you go back here a bit, this part. So first you squeeze the ball and then the pressure inside will, get in, will be getting smaller. And then if you put this bulb you know, on the top and then put the tip of the pipette in the solution, and then you slowly you know, release your hands or, and your fingers, and then the solution will be sucked up due to the pressure difference inside and outside. Does this make sense to you guys? I'm explaining the principle, but the best way for you is to get the chance to work in the lab, and then you will get you know, the best experience, right? I think for the other parts are uh, okay. We use our finger. If the solution is corrosive, you definitely should wear gloves because you know sometimes there's some solution you know goes up to the top. So you use your finger to press the top part of the pipette and then to prevent it draining. And then when you want to drain it, and then you release your your thumb, and then you can start to you know drain the solution into is either the waste beaker or the the container you want, okay? So this is how we operate this, guys. So let's go back to the, the question here. Uh, let me see, do I have an example here? Uh, I can make an example. Let's say I have a 18.4 molar or mole per liter concentrated sulfuric acid. I want to dilute into 18.4 mole per liter. Uh, I purposely you know, chose this value because I don't want you guys to think about any calculation. Basically it means I need to dilute 10 times, right? So if I'm still using a 500 milliliter, sorry. If I'm still using you know, a 500 milliliter volumetric flask for the dilute solution, can you think about how many milliliter of the original concentrated solution I should get? This one is 500, it will be my final volume, right? But what is, what is the initial volume I need to get if I need to dilute 10 times? It should be 50, right? Because 50 original solution into 500 in total new solution is diluted by 10 times. So actually my question is guiding you guys to think about what is changed during the dilution, what is not changed during the dilution, right? Let's give me a second.
Sorry, guys. Uh, so what is changed? What is not changed, guys? I would say the concentration definitely is changed, right? What is not changed during the whole process? The most of the solute actually is not changed. What I meant is the most of the solute in the concentrated solution is the same as the most of solute in the diluted solution, right? So this is why, when I take 50 out and I dilute into 500, the most of the pure sulfuric acid is the same. And because the volume is increased by 10 times, so the molarity is decreased to the one tenth. Does this make sense to you guys? So the equation we used here is called C1 times V1 equals to C2 times V2. What does this mean? This is C is the concentration, the molarity of the original solution. V1 is the volume of the original solution you take to transfer to a new container. And here is the new concentration, the new molarity, and here is the new total volume. As you can see, both of these two equals to the most of the solute, right? Does this make sense? Okay, cool. Guys, I don't have example set up here, but I think this is something you can consider. So that means if you want to get a diluted solution, you first need to do some calculation. You need to figure out how many milliliters of the original solution I need to transfer. And then you use the volumetric pipette to do the transfer, and then you add water, and then until the new mark, and you got a new diluted solution with a specified molarity you want. Okay, guys, I hope you got a good sense about this. We definitely need to do some practice about this later. Not probably not in class. Uh, I need to speed up a little bit. Uh, I try to finish the contents, you know, uh, this lecture notes in class. So next one is about limiting reactants and yields. Uh, you know, I think this is relatively straightforward. Now say you want to make some hot dogs, you have the bomb, you have the hot dog, you know, you, you put, you know, each hot dog in each bun. But you know, if the number is not you know pair, you probably have you know either the bun or hot dog left, right? So that means the hot dog here with a last number is called the oh sorry <laughs> the bun here with a smaller number here is the limiting reagent or reactants, and this one is completely reactive. Does this make sense? Or we call this into access reactants or reagent okay so how should we solve problems like this how can we figure out which one is limiting which one is in access the best way is called bca table it sounds stupid but it's always the best b means before c means change a means after let me give you an example so now say I have a reaction like this. You don't need to care about too much about, and let me give you a little bit more familiar reaction, guys. Give me a second. Now say I have hydrogen peroxide decomposed into water and oxygen gas. So I balance it in this way. So now say, oh, this is only one reactant, guys. Sorry, this is a bad example. <laughs> uh, I will use a, you know, Another, now say 2A plus 3B producing something. Okay, we don't care about what are the other products. So now initially, now say I have 10 mole each. So can we figure out what the limit reactants? Obviously we can think about without doing any calculation, right? But the easy way is now suppose this 10 mole of A is used out. That means it's minus 10 mole. After the reaction, it got into zero mole. And at the same time, guys, think about how many moles of B is consumed if 10 moles of A is gone based on the ratio. It should be 15 moles, right? But we only have 10 moles, right? 
Can you figure out the 15 most? It's here we stop. Two, react Nothing with three. Uh -oh. Check if the device is on your home Wi-Fi network. Sorry, guys. What should I do? There's nothing to stop here. Check if the device is on your home Wi-Fi network. Okay, now it's gone. So obviously we got a wrong direction, right? So we should say this one is completely gone. And then I got zero more left. Oh, it seems like I use a very bad example because 10 is not really a good number. Now, say so we have 15 modes in the beginning, okay? Sorry about this. And now we use all of 15 modes. We got zero mode in the end for B. So at this moment, 10 modes of A is gone, right? Does this make sense to you guys? Because the coefficient here actually is like how many bombs, how many hot dogs, right? So it represents a mole number. So when 15 mole of B is gone, 10 mole of A is gone. And then, you know, I got five moles remain for A, right? That means B is my limiting reactance and A is in access. Make sense? Okay. So this method is called BCA table or BCA method. But let me emphasize, this method is based on a balanced equation. If your ba equation is not balanced or is not balanced correctly, all the work you did is wrong, right? You can, you can imagine that, right? So balancing the equation is always the first step and it's critical. You always need to check whether your reaction is balanced or not, okay? Okay, guys, let's have a quick look. So here, First, can you recognize what is the reaction? Did you see the change? Some NO is binding with O2, change into NO2, right? So how to balance this equation? I think if you are a little bit experienced, you can quickly figure out it's like this, right? No problem. And then we can count the number of the molecules. So for NO, I got one, two, three, four, five, six. So initially, for four, I got six. For O2, I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I also got six. So obviously, uh, after the change, that's it, minus six. This one is minus, how many guys? Minus three, right? Because two moles of NO reacting with one mole of O2, or you can just say two NO reacting with one O2. So here is minus three. So the after is zero and three. So you will see, you know, NO is a limiting reactance and O2 is in excess. I hope this makes sense to you. Uh, so limiting reactance is definitely a very important concept in you know, stoichiometry. So next part is really a review of significant figures. This is, should be done in honor scan or any first year chemistry, right? So I want to quickly review this part. Significant figures always means a lot of certain digits plus one and only one estimated digit, which is the last one. So if I need to read how many significant figures are here, it's just a three. All of the certain plus one uncertain. But if I want to read the significant figure here, there are only two because the, the first two is for sure. The second five is uncertain, right? Why we get different results? Because we are using different rulers. In the left ruler, you see the smallest mark is 0 0.1. Uh, I believe the unit is I don't know what is the unit. Now suppose it's centimeter, okay? So the smallest mark is 0 0.1 centimeter. And then you see actually is in between 2.5, which is here and 2.6. So we are very sure the two and the five because both of these two are certain, right? But we knew we need to estimate one more digit. We have to estimate one more digit but different people may get a slight different results. So I might get into 0 0.55 
and you may get into 0 0.56, or even another thing will get the two point, sorry, not zero, sorry, 2.55 or 2.56 or 2.54. So that means the last digit can be varied a little bit, which is acceptable because it is uncertain. We accept that, right? And by using another ruler, can I continue to read into 2.55? No way, because this five, the first five is even uncertain, right? So it's meaningless for you to read another five. So we always want to keep one uncertain digit, which is the 2.5 here. So actually the significant figures is related to the measurement is related to the precision of your instruments here is a ruler right okay so i, I hope you guys got a good sense about why we care about significant figures okay and how we should you know read the correct significant figures uh let me give you an assignment guys can you take maybe 30 seconds to quickly read the length of this leaf and recall your results with the correct significant figure you can send me your results you know either with everyone or just send to me okay i can make it a slightly larger for, the, for you to get a good sense guys as i mentioned we probably will end at around 9 15 today okay Thanks, Sid, I got your answer. Mm, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I will type, you know, the answer from all of you guys, uh, if I can. Uh, I will read that. So I got one 3.58, uh, uh, 3 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.52, 3.59, 3.61. 3 with unit, very good, guys. I appreciate you guys consider the unit because I blocked some part and this ruler didn't show what is the unit, but you do need to, you know, recall the unit, right? This is a very important part. So I think this is a great example of your understanding and also exactly showed you the uncertainty. That means the three and the five is for sure, right? We all agree with that. Those are certain digits, but the last one different student got a slight different reading because that one is estimated. So all of your answers are okay. I would not say 3.52 is too small. It is totally okay. Even the 3.61 is acceptable, okay? The last digit is uncertain, okay? 3.61 might be a little bit off, uh, but you know, because you know, this is not, we do not have a ruler to really, you know, catch what is the, the point. But it doesn't matter. We don't need to get the exact, you know, results because the last digit should be estimated. Very good, guys. You know, the key point is you should report three significant figures, including the last, you know, uncertain digit. Thank you, guys. Uh, how about this one? Uh, what I need is how much, how many milliliter of solution is added through this long glass tube? which is called burette. So please also send me your answers, okay? We have the initial reading, we have the final reading. Oh, Salina, uh, did you just join? Okay, great, great. Good to have you. Uh, we are approaching to the end, but uh, for sure, I will send you the recording. Please you know, send me an email to remind me, okay? Yeah. Uh, this one might take a little bit more time because we need to do two readings and get the difference, right? The volume difference is what do we need. So the unit this time is definitely a milliliter. 
Oh, sure. How to read the volume in the burat? So basically, first you need to catch the lowest point of this, you know, shape, right? And we should catch, uh, let me make my, we should catch this. And then we want to find what is the reading. So this is nine, as you can see, this is 10, right? So we should read in this direction. This is 9.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5. This line is 9.5. This is 9.6. This is 9.7, 8, 9, and then 10, 9.10, which is, what is 9.10? No, 9.10 is 10. <laughs> okay, so I think you see that the, uh, the, the line is actually something in between 9.6 and 9.7. But we are very sure it's definitely more than 9.6. So we should have one more estimated digit. So now say I probably will read into 9.62. Let me remove my, my marks here. Yeah, I think 9.32 or maybe 9.3. Sorry, what I'm doing, 9.62, 9.63 are all you know, okay. You may have got a slight different answer, right? Okay, and then in the second one, I will say it's 24, 20, 24.234.14 or 15 or something like that. But we are sure, two, four, one, those stitches are certain, right? But the last four is estimated. And then you do a subtraction and you got a difference. So I will use my calculator to get the results, which is 24.14 minus 9.62. I got 14.52. So what I want to emphasize is the, the difference. The first digit is for sure. The second is for sure. The third one is for sure, but this one, is questionable, right? Is uncertain because this is the transfer of the uncertainty. Because this digit is uncertain, this digit is uncertain. So your last digit here should be uncertain. Does this make sense, guys? So you might get 14.51, 14.50, 14.53, no problem at all, right? But you just make sure for this one, you should have two decimals. For this one, you should also have two decimals for the final results you should have two decimals. Okay, guys, I want to summarize. How, what are the rules when we, you know, do calculation with the consideration of significant figures? For addition and subtraction, you assign the significant figures in the answer based on the number of the decimal places in each original measurement. That means you should follow the one with the least decimals. For example, 3.4, time sorry plus 5.67 you got an essay 709.07 how should you keep your final answer you should write down into 9.1 why this one is uncertain this one is uncertain but when you add them together both of these two are uncertain makes sense right because it's the transfer of the uncertainty but based on our rule you only should record one uncertain digit. So this is why you need to run this seven into 9.1. I hope this makes sense to you. So addition, subtraction, you follow the decimal place, which has the least one, okay? But when you do multiply or divide, you should follow the one with the smallest total significant figures. That means, for this one, your final answer should have two significant figures because 3.4 has only two. So if I use the calculator to get the results, I got 19. I should write down 19 or 19 point, okay? 19 point might be a little bit better because we are sure where is the point. That means I do not have a zero after the point, right? Guys, I will give this to you guys. Could you please, you know, take, you know, just use your calculator matter, the scientific calculator or the calculator from your phone to get the results and report your answer 
with the correct significant figures. Oh, thank you. I got you know a lot of answers from you guys. I appreciate. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yeah, it's Beatrice, right? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, I got some different answers. I will read it briefly. I got a 62.9. I got a 62.94. Obviously, these two are different. I got a 62.9535. Uh, I appreciate, you know, your consideration of all of the results from your calculator. I got a 62.9. Uh, okay. Uh, I got another 62.9. So it seems like the most common answer is 62.9. Let's check, guys. So the first one, 3.4 plus 7.65, 0, 11. I got this. How many significant figures I should keep? I should follow this one, right? So I should change this into, around this into 11.1. .1. Do you guys agree? Due to the same reason, this one is uncertain. So both of these two digits are uncertain, right? And then I got 11.1 .1 times 5.67. So the final answer should have six and you should do the rounding, right? Okay, that's it, right? This is the correct answer. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, we got a little bit of time to briefly talk about the last example here. The question is slightly long. Let me briefly you know, pick up the most important information here. So we have 1.73 gram of salicylic acid, which is this one, 1.73 gram. I will list some important information here. I got a 1.0 milliliter of acidic anhydride, which is this thing, the second reactants. And I yield 1.50 gram of acetyl salicylic acid, which is this thing. Uh, you don't need to care about the organic chem because we only care about the numbers here, but it's stoichiometry, okay? Uh, the first question is we need to figure out what is the limiting reactants. How should we do that? we need to convert the mass, the volume into something we can compare, which can be compared. That means we, one molecule of this thing can react with one molecule of that thing, right? Of that molecule. Basically, one mole can react with one mole. We're assuming this reaction is balanced. So only the moles are comparable. You cannot compare the mass directly because it's now one gram reacting with one gram, right? It's now one liter reacting with one liter. It's one mole reacting with one mole. So guys, we need to convert this into the moles. I also need to convert this into the moles, and then I will compare the moles number to see which one is smaller. The smaller one is the limiting reactants. Does this make sense, guys? Okay. So. But for this one, I think you guys all know how to do it. We just need to figure out what is the molar mass, which can be either find in Google or use the atomic mass from the periodic table and add them one by one, right? 12 carbons, let's say 12.01 times seven. Oh, sorry, not 12 carbons, seven carbons. 12.01 times seven plus six hydrogens, 1.0086 times six plus 16.00 times three, and you got the molar mass, right? And for this thing, we need to first convert the volume into the mass. So this is why we need to use the density, right? For one milliliter is 1.08 gram. So the total mass is 1.08 gram. And then similarly, I got the molar mass. Guys, I didn't show the forework here. I hope you guys can take some time to show your forework, especially taking care of the significant figures. I set up the significant figures purposely here. As you can see, there are three here, but there are only two here, right? Pay attention to the significant figures, okay? So, and then we figure out what are the limiting reactants. Guys, 
the final product will be determined by the limited reactance rather than the excess reactance, right? Because excess reactance will have some left, which will not control the final results, the final products. So that means when we say the yield, we are talking about how many grams of product can we get. So now suppose this one is one mole, this one is two mole, I will say our products is only one mole, right? Because the two mole is in excess. Makes sense, right? So we should use the limit reactants, the most, the most of the limit reactants should equal to the most of the products. And then I further convert that into the mass and I got the theoretical yield, right? Guys, I have the answer here for you to check. Uh, I will send you guys the annotation. So if you have any question, check the annotation first. If you still do not understand the work on the annotation, send me emails, okay? For the last question, we have a concept called percent yield. What does that mean? Is the actual yield in grant divided by the theoretical yield in grant? You probably wonder why there's a percent? Should it always be 100%? Not actually, because the organic reaction may not be complete, right? So we are assuming all of the limiting reactants is completely converted into my products, but actually this is not always the case. So this is why we need to use the actual yields in gram divided by the theoretical yield in gram, and then I can get the answer, right? Guys, I will leave this for your homework and check my annotation later. If you got exactly the same answer, I don't think you need, you need to check my annotation. But if you have no clue or you got a different answer, please check the annotation later, okay? Oh, the last question is also for your homework. Uh, it's a similar one, but it's a little bit more you know, in, integrated because it's a combination of molarity calculation, limiting reactance, kind of you know, yield, uh, no percent yield here. Okay, guys, this is pretty much our first class. Um, <clears throat> if you have any feedback, suggestion, please let me know by email. Uh, after the class. Uh, I, I want to, you know, apologize again for the time confusion. Uh, and I also want to briefly, you know, check with you uh, because I got some, uh, some student who told me I'm from the West Coast, you know, 7.30 p.m. is too early for me. I also got some, you know, you know, complaint from the East, Eastern Coast, now say 7.30, sorry, 10, 30 is too late for me. So I want to get a balance. I want to check with you guys. So uh, I, I would be really appreciate if you can, you know, try your best to make the time available for you guys, because, you know, I know, you know, this is a, it's not a very large class, but, you know, still everyone is quite busy. Okay. So can 8.30 to 10 p.m. Eastern time work for you guys. You can just send me, you know, privately. So I'm talking about Eastern time, guys, please do some translation. I don't know which, you know, time zone you're from. I see, I see. Guys, I know probably this time is not the best one for you guys, but I really appreciate if you can accommodate to the new time. But I really want to, you know, make the, the most students available to the class. Okay, thanks for uh, all of your response. I believe, let me count how many responses I, I got. Uh, okay, 
Uh, it seems like I didn't get any objection yet, although I saw, you know, once you mentioned about, you know, this is not probably not the best time, right? But once again, I really appreciate if you can make it, okay? Because I, I do want to, you know, have everyone uh, involved and do not missing the, uh, miss the live class. Okay, guys, uh, if I will further send the email to officially confirm with all of you guys uh, to talk about this time, but uh, this is just, you know, a kind of, you know, survey, a unofficial survey. Uh, so if there's no, you know, strong objection, uh, we will say starting from our starting from our next class, we will start from A30. But please, you know, check my email afterwards. Okay, guys, homework. <clears throat> uh, I plan to finish lecture note one, but you you probably see I have two lecture notes for stoichiometry, right? I will reserve the second one by the end of the whole season because I found some benefit in doing this. Uh, it's it's a little bit challenging for some students in the beginning because stoichiometry, you know, is there's a lot of math, right? So I probably will put that in the end and we will start from lecture note three, starting from our next class, okay? And then feel free to do the homework. Uh, the homework includes the contents for both lecture note one and lecture note two. But if you have any issue with some questions, it's totally okay. So please just submit those you can finish, okay? So this is relatively flexible, but I do expect all of you submit your homework on time, even if it's not completed, okay? Uh, Yes, I will post the homework in Google Classroom later, okay, later today. Okay, great, guys. Uh, unless you have any question about the time or the contents, you are free to go. Please check my assignment in the Google Classroom. Please, you know, wait, in, wait for my email about the time and any other coming announcement, okay? I will see you next time. If you do have question about the time, please stay here for a while. I want to briefly talk with you. Okay, guys, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.